Okay. Uh, hey guys, how's it going? My name's Matt Rosenblum, uh, and I'm here with Brendan Ward. How are you doing today, Brendan? I'm doing well. Yourself? Pretty good. This, this is the first time um, we are doing a, I've done a lot of interviews in the past, but I've never done one live. Um, so this is my first live interview. So we're testing out a lot of things, seeing how this works. Um, and it's kind of exciting just to see what will happen out of it. Um, so let's dive in. So first, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, and what do we do when the Amazon delivery arrives? <laughs> we'll stop. We'll take it. Oh, yeah. I, we'll just go with whatever it's improv now. It's just uh, we're going with whatever we get. Great. Um, well, thanks a lot for the time. Um, my name's Brendan Ward. I'm a leadership coach with the Living Wisdom Project and also an adjunct professor at NYU and just recently finished teaching a new course at NYU Wagner on disability and specifically examining the intersection of disability and diversity with leadership in general and examining all sorts of angles there, not just the, the classic awareness piece around why organizations and leaders, we need to be very tuned up on the whole topic of diversity, but examining what is it about us as leaders that might make us by default not consider diversity and where else that might show up in the organization. So my own interest in that from a research perspective is figuring out how we go beyond just the box ticking on diversity so here and there we do see organizations that like to tick the box around diversity and inclusion and it's often skin deep mm. um, i'm convinced that's not just the end of the story because uh, in the end if it's very integrated that's actually going to show up in positive ways in the business performance it's going to show up in happier clients going to show up in happier employees and i think as a result diversity needs to be much more than a box ticking exercise right and I, if you go and look at some of these diversity scores and indices and all the rest of it i think it actually reveals a lot more about organizations than what you would think um, so anyway that's something I'm, I'm studying a bit more and obviously with the course in nyu we're diving into that whole topic Right. And one, from what I know about the NYU Wagner School, that's specifically for, it has like a very social, um, what would you call it, I guess, social organizational component. Right. Um, Absolutely. Graduate School of Public Service. So mm -hmm. Wagner is very focused on public sector, nonprofit sector, NGOs, international organizations, and they are the school that specializes in the Masters of Public Administration, and um, among others, so there's urban planners there, there's healthcare managers there, there's transportation experts there. So when it comes to researching and studying and examining public service from the broadest perspective, Wagner is really the, the center point at NYU. And it partners obviously with lots of the other schools who've got their own interest in, in public topics let's say so it's absolutely not an mba uh, place um, but it i wouldn't say it's um, agnostic about business because in the end there's bright spots across all sectors when it comes to doing good and doing great at the same time mm -hmm. so yeah, coming sure. from, my own background is in banking so i worked in the banking sector for about 15 years and i i thought to myself as i moved from that into public sector that hey you know you need a completely different dna if you want to work in the private sector compared to the public sector or third sector but there's actually a lot more commonality than you uh, think yeah um, that, that's what i um that, that's good that you have that, that insight because i don't know that that much about the nonprofit sector but i i'm figure like I, I figure that if i were to run a nonprofit business or if i were to enter that world um i'm hoping that the skills that i have now will translate over into that into that area right right and it's there's a brilliant book by jim collins um, yep i know it from good to great and there's so many different versions mm -hmm. of it uh, the concepts the same right what are the things that drive great performances to think from just 
mediocre or good performance. Mm -hmm. And he's making a point that, you know, this intersection of what what you're good at, what you care about, and what pays, that sweet spot of all three things coming together. Yeah. Right. And he also wrote the book, he also wrote the book applied to the, the public sector too, right? There was like a... Right. right. And we, uh, we studied some of that at Wagner and uh, I, it blew me away because you would think sitting inside, let's say, a bank, looking out of the windows at the rest of society, you would think, hang on, the stuff we're doing here has got nothing to do with so many other organizations out there, especially in New York City, where, you know, you would think, hey, Wall Street's totally different from the nonprofit sector. And they're both huge presences in New York, but they don't seem to have a lot in common. But the point that Collins is making is actually they do. Um, this question about what are you good at, what do you care about, and what pays, it's exactly the same critical questions that nonprofits need to answer, that for profit needs to answer, and even as as individuals we need to answer. Mm -hmm. When it comes yeah. down like on the coaching side of things, it's it's something I've started to use with folks when we're talking through their jobs and what they want to do. And you know, you could ask yourself, hey, what what do I actually care about? I mean if I'm going to be working eight, nine, 10 hours a day, or even 12 hours a day, right, right, right. it would be helpful to start with what I care about and get that purpose bit down. And that's hard to do when we're trying to pay off student loans and just get a job. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that the lesson, like, we should think about it as integrated. The lesson from non the nonprofit, like you have a mission-driven business, a purpose-driven business, there's no reason that shouldn't be also in the private sector. Um, right. And it's like kind of an integrated kind of thinking. Um, so I have a question for you. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago? What do I wish I knew 10 years ago besides Brexit? Um, <laughs> yeah, besides Brexit and... Uh, <laughs> I think you actually give me the answer in something you just said, Matt, which is integration. Mm. Integration. I think is something that if you said to me 10 years ago, hey, uh, how integrated is your life or how integrated is your work? Um, at the time, I probably would have said, yeah, it's integrated, you know, right? We, we go to work, we earn money, we pay the bills, we do stuff, you know? We all have commitments of one kind or another. And often that involves money, also involves time too. But, you know, we're, we're very much driven around this model of, get our education, get a return on that investment. And then we work hard. We're essentially renting out our, our mind, our brain, our physical ability, our relationship ability. We're renting that out to our employer who's paying us rent in the form of the mm. paycheck. Right. We off with that money and we do things with it. But um, looking back now, <coughs> looking back now, and I bring up Collins again, when you look back at what you're actually spending your time doing, so you might be good at it, you know? And I found in my own case, I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed working with numbers. I really enjoyed the analytical stuff. And I just, I felt in that flow when it came to numbers. Um, but the thing that didn't strike me as much as it does now is the whole thing around purpose and around what do you really care about because it's easy to tell ourselves hey you know this is important the job needs to get done we have to get this trade done we have to get that project delivered whatever but when you go much deeper with that when you go much deeper into purpose and ask yourself what do i really care about you know right um, so that for me i think this point around integration um and i think when it comes to developing talent in large organizations. It's, it's a really key point because I think a superficial approach to people management doesn't cut it for people, especially for millennials coming along. You know, this kind of airy-fairy, you know, courses here and there that are kind of incidental things or even uh, charity events or, you know, anything that's an add-on, I think is a problem because... Mm -hmm things don't tend to be very well integrated. Right. I think you're totally right. Like, I know people who also typically you hear about people they're like, oh, they start in um 
the private sector and then they move like you hear about them like they want to do something more meaningful and purposeful and they move toward the public sector but really like just as many people are taking the opposite approach starting in the public and then going to the private like i know i know people who just, like do all the social work my the people my age um, and then they realize that they're not really integrating, like getting money out of this in the way that they want to support themselves. So it's that kind of, there's a need to balance the strengths of the private sector and the public sector. Um, and then just even more generally speaking, just all of life where your work feels like an extension of your social life and your personal values. And it's all kind of coming together. Right. Right. And when you think about it from a, whether it's non-profit or for-profit, I mean, in the end, performance is important, right? Because we need to return to our shareholders. We need to mm -hmm. essentially provide a captivating return to our owners who might be shareholders or, you know, our stakeholders if we're in the non-profit sphere. So we need to be able to prove that we're using uh, foundation grants efficiently, you know, that we're making the impact and keeping costs to a minimum. So. It doesn't really matter whether it's for profit or non profit, in my own opinion. That that drive to perform exists, that drive for excellence exists. But when you think about integration, what happens if you're not integrated? You can imagine it is a productivity killer. You know, when you think about the extent to which people might be disenfranchised or disengaged, or they might be not really feeling the love because they just don't understand the strategy. Or they, it doesn't speak to them, whatever this strategy is. Right. And I'd say it's a particular challenge in the private sector because, in some ways, nonprofits have that mission. They're they're only there for their mission, right? In the end, and it's it's harder, I think, in the for-profit sphere, for a private company to convince someone coming in, right? A, a budding graduate coming in. It's hard for them to convince beyond just money, and yeah, uh, you know, it's hard to convince them, right, you should believe in this purpose. And I think that's where productivity, whether it's at the start of the career or maybe down the road, 10, 20 years, if someone doesn't really believe in the mission of the organization, then it, it's, it's a productivity killer, right? Because they're not, they're not on the edge of performance. They're not yeah. stretching, not really that motivated to go the extra mile or think about things differently. Very yeah. true. Yeah, like I, it's just if you're not really connected to it, you're not going to really think creatively about it, um, and you're not going to really have the drive to, you know, right. work. I guess not. Not really. Not necessarily longer, but just ha like use your whole capacities when it comes to what you're doing, and really put your whole self into it. Right. And going back to the earlier point, and I, I can see we're kind of heading into this topic of the video, the binary trap, uh, which we'll come back to in a second, but. When you think about getting that engagement from employees, integration, there's that word again, is so vital because if, if let's take financial services, if people in teams can see how their daily work in a business line connects through to diverse clients or diverse groups in a community, you know, so if you can really see that your products are reaching a diverse audience, then you'll see that diversity actually means something in the day-to-day -day life of a, an insurance company, a bank, whatever it is. That's very different than running around one day a year with Meals on Wheels to the elderly. That's not very integrated. Right. I, I see what you're saying. So diversity being beyond a checklist means that, like, if you have really integration is having all the different moving parts coming together. And that's what diversity should mean is that you have a lot of different diverse elements of your, of your organization and then how it comes all together. That's like real diversity. How it right. Should form. right. And I, what, what triggered me there on the binary trap and the title of the video was there is a binary trap, right? Thinking that for profit and nonprofit are somehow totally separate. You're either for profit or you're not for profit and they're very separate things and to be honest with you that's what i thought uh, going from the private sector into studying at wagner and then going on to teach at wagner i was very much caught on that trap myself um, mm. until, I, until i got through the study and kind of woke up um to say that 
uh, there are totally different sectors, you know, the three different sectors, let's say private, public, and third, to say they're totally different, not at all to do with each other. Uh, you know, the private sector guys are all like money grabbers and the nonprofit guys are all do-gooders. Exactly right. It is so reductive. It's very reductive. And I think therein lies the trap on any of these kind of dualist wow. approaches. It's uh, life, whether it's the goals of an organization or individual values or approaches to things you know once we get into this binary thinking and dualism around it's either all on or all off i think that's a trap that we get caught in all the time and uh, none of us can escape it easily but i think being aware of it is is really key uh gotcha and it looks like i just updated the video settings i'm just playing around with this i think i had it on you the whole time but now it's going and now it'll be back and forth again anyway we're learning as we go <laughs> yeah um what's the most common mistake people are making when it comes to organizational performance i know you already touched into this but i want to hear concretely like what's the big mistake that people are making for me this is my own view of things <coughs> i've got a bit of a bug still from the last few days in new york so um i'm running out of breath from time to time I, I, honestly think and obviously it's a big challenge with ai and machine learning and all the rest of it as soon I, once we start treating people like machines it's all over mm, it's I, all, I, yeah that's over. Uh, anything that's when you turn someone to like a robot or a machine that's just totally reducing them to being this automated tool and like not only is that not effective for performance but it's just human like it doesn't feel good for the person that's that's uh, being treated as a robot. And that, what you just said, Matt, is common sense. It's absolutely, if you asked anyone on the street, I'm yeah. sure I could give you that answer. Like 99 out of 100 people would say, would say that. And the problem with common sense is, you know, it's uncommon. You know, it theoretically makes sense to us, but it doesn't always turn into action. And I'm not really talking here about the inevitable march of progress, right? There's things that we as humans have done, like driving a car, that, thank goodness we're going to have driverless cars, you know, I mean, it's going to be tough, but, you know, it, it's it's progress, right? It's, it's, it's progress to have automation for very manual tasks that are potentially risky. Uh, and often, you know, as we've seen in history, and it's going to be true in the future, you know, machines, robots, whatever you call them, will generally give us a more predictable result and a better arc accuracy rate and lower levels of risk. And it'll free us humans up to do eventually nothing but leisure, right? That's the prediction, right? Right. It'll end up nothing for us to do because machines and robots are doing doing it all but we're not there yet right we're not there yet and we're quite a ways off that and i think when you asked about organizational performance to me i think a big problem is when we 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 think that the industrial revolution right which was the huge breakthrough that we made uh, the last mega breakthrough that we made when we start to think that you know humans are some kind of add-on to these machines that we we built mm. steam engines and all the rest of it like uh, saying that people are our greatest assets and then treating people like machines mm. to make them problematic because people see through that they see through it and if everyone in the organization doesn't come in in the morning ready to go ready to push ready to care ready to make a difference and if you know they don't leave at night with a smile even if it's a tired smile but some kind of a satisfaction <laughs> you know i i just don't know what we're at i just don't know what we are at because um there's ways and means of organizing teams and organizing projects and motivating people and engaging people but if we treat people like machines i think the game's over and we're just kidding ourselves. We're just kidding ourselves that, right. oh, yeah, you know what? We treat people like dogs or machines or what have you. And then we're somehow surprised when things go wrong. Or we're somehow surprised that people leave unexpectedly 
or that there's low employee and get, you know satisfaction and all the rest of it so i think it it is easier to treat people like machines because you just you stop caring and you stop trying but i think that's where as leaders we become responsible for dragging down the performance of an organization because we're the ones that are actually causing that right the performance yeah. organization, the buck stops with the leaders if the staff are not happy if the employees are making mistakes my own view let's go to the leaders and ask them what's going on because they are responsible they are responsible well said well definitely well said and i agree with you 100 percent on everything um so tell me something that's true that almost no one agrees with you about oh dear i better stay out of politics <laughs> <laughs> okay we don't have to we can avoid this question <laughs> that no one agrees with me on. Hmm, that's a good one. That that presupposes that I actually ask people their opinion from time to time, and that when they give it to me, that I pay attention and take it on board, um, which I, I try to do. Um, I, I, here's one, here's one, here's one. Um, there's a lot, you know, with the 24 hour media, and all the rest of it you know we get a lot of coverage of problems in the world and you hear this narrative that says something like people just don't care do you know like as a society we're kind of uh, indifferent to each other and i i fundamentally disagree with that mm. says, you know um, care, they're, they just maybe don't know how to go about the change i think i think that it, it it's very tempting and i've fallen into this trap many times it's tempting to rush to a conclusion about someone else and this could be true in a work setting or outside a work setting you know when you're uh, walking down the corridor and your boss's boss passes you by in a hurry doesn't say hello doesn't say how are you doesn't doesn't even acknowledge you you know people are our greatest assets by the way you know <laughs> that can be really hard to swallow you know and it can hurt you when you're busting your guts every day and all you want is a nod or someone to say hello or it could happen in the street right on your way to work but it's so easy for us to jump into this presumption that uh, you know they intended that right they intended it because they don't care about us junior people or you know they don't care about strangers you know no one can be trusted or whatever and there's all sorts of deductions that you could make but i think we forget about the blinkers that we've all got on a lot of the time, you know, a lot of people are under pressure to get their work done, to get to get to work, to do a good job at work, to somehow, you know, show up in 100 meetings in 12 hours. And to expect people like that in that kind of pressure with those kind of blinkers on to actually notice everything and notice enough and to be fully kind of awake um i i think it's a tall order because the reality is none of us well only the extremely enlightened people are fully awake and you know, we've all got some kind of blinkers on right yeah. mm -hmm. and i've seen it with myself too where i get very cross about something i think i can't believe they just said that or i can't believe they just reacted that way and when you step back and think about the blinkers that someone else might have and the blinkers we have on ourselves you know <clears throat> we need to give each other a break you know what i mean um and i think that that can be hard if we're if we're big on accountability if we believe in holding each other to account mm -hmm. um, that can be hard right because we demand better standards and we we're not willing to compromise but at the same time we have to understand look uh, who of us don't wear blinkers every day at some point? Right. It so can seem like sometimes we, we're like kind of too, um, we're unapologetic about things as a culture and like don't have this sense of maybe compassion or forgiveness uh, about someone making mistakes or just uh, having, just kind of holding people like you're the enemy and having this us versus them mentality. Right. There's an interesting, body of research around this um self other overlap let's say so it it shows up shows up everywhere but sp 
specifically we're studying at NYU there from the concept of is our people's attitude to overlap between self and other, you know, so mm. how much do me and you overlap because we're talking to each other here? Like, does Matt feel responsible in any way for Brendan and vice versa? And then thinking about that as a predictor for whether or not someone will be interested in nonprofit work, in working with people with disabilities, you know, so there's lots of research around exactly this thing. And, you know, it actually, self other overlap is vital right it's, it's vital because our whole society hinges on our ability to connect with each other right because we're nothing if we're not relationships and in in the organizations where there is time for people to mingle and there is time for people to work in teams you can see you know you're fostering that self other overlap and it just it it just brings out so much more strength because of trust that gets built and you know strong relationships and accountability right because you know you can hold people to account when you trust them and you don't mind being held to account when you trust someone well, I and mean, it's not like all or nothing like if you don't do this thing i still will respect you as a human being right is there anything else you would like to uh, share with us before we wrap up? Yeah, I think actually we went down the road of integration um, and talked about that a lot. And we touched on the binary thing. Uh, one thing that's come up quite a bit uh, lately, just in conversations I've had with folks on the coaching side of things, is um, this binary self conception, let's say, you know, when we think of ourselves as one thing or another, or like we said before, you know, organizations that see themselves were definitely one thing or definitely not another thing. But I suppose just one thing that I'd, I'd, I'd leave for the viewers is moving ourselves away from that kind of dualism to thinking of a dimmer switch, you know, the classic dimmer switch, you know, are lights always on or off? Or are they, are they always in some variation between low and strong lights? And I think when it comes to our own approach to work, um, it's tempting to have those blinkers on, right? And to think of ourselves as one thing or another. You know, I'm the planning and control guy, or I'm the creative guy, or I'm the this, that, or the other guy. Um, I think as managers and leaders in the organizations, we should work with our people to encourage uh, the blinkers to come off and to not try not to fall into the trap of this dualistic oh i'm i i can only do this or i can only do that yeah. or those guys in that team over there you know they're useless all they do is sit around brainstorming all day you know <laughs> they oh never get anything done right but, uh great yeah great metaphor with the dimmers i really like that a lot right. um and thank you so much for sharing everything that you said uh, i think this is really insightful um and anyone interested in optimizing organizational performance and um, just overcoming dualistic thinking in any context um, should find value out of this. So I appreciate you sharing these insights. Pleasure.